good evening, people of God. Good evening, good evening. We pray that you're here. Let's go right into prayer tonight. I have a lot I want to deal with tonight. I want to unpack a lot of scriptures tonight. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, we decree and declare your glory. We thank you for another opportunity to preach your word, your word to your people. Father, we pray for revelation now so flow free in the name of prophetic utterances. We rebuke and bind the witch and the warlock that comes against this word. We thank you that you bind the fault finding and spectating spirit. Father, that you will give us a grace for the hero, Father, that shall bring forth fruit. God, speak through my vocal cords, speak through my mind. Father God, it is all of you and none of me that I pray in the mighty name of Jesus. We say amen. I greet you in the all-sufficient name of the Lord Jesus Christ, for Jesus is the Lord, and there is no other name that's greater than his. If you are just coming in, we greet you, we greet you from the great city of East St. Louis, from one of the greatest churches in America, that's New Bethel Missionary Baptist Church, and we say to New Bethel Nation, good evening. This is pastor wants to deal with uh, a sermon, sermon title tonight, talking about prioritizing the Word of God. I want to jump right in this tonight. I don't want to play around. Uh, we got some announcements that we want to give you. Of course, Reverend Cole to come and open the doors of the church when I get done preaching. But tonight I want to focus on, listen to me, prioritizing the Word of God. Prioritizing the Word of God. The word prioritize means this, people of God. It means to designate or to treat something as more important than other things. So when you give something priority in your life, that means that it's been designated or treated as more important than other things. Your job may be a priority, and it is. Your children are a priority, and they should be. Your spouse, if you are married, should be a priority. But let me tell you all something. All of those things are held up by the Word of God. So where you put priority in, 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 with the Word of God will determine how you treat those things that God has given you to be a steward of. Don't you know that those are not your kids, that God gave them to you so that you can give them back to Him? You are a steward. That is not your spouse, per se. That is a child of God that God has given you stewardship over. That's not your job. That is a seed factory by which God has given you to be a steward over it. It is not your life. That life belongs to God. He purchased, purchased it with the blood of his son Jesus on Calvary's Hill. So then how we steward that ship will determine the outcome or what those things that God has given us to produce, how they will produce. So then it begs to, to say that we need to have priority in God's word. God's word is the lamp unto your feet and it is the light unto your path. So, so I tell you this all the time. One of the greatest things that you can do is become born again. Giving Jesus your life is the greatest decision you will ever make. Over having children. Over getting married. Over getting your dream job. The greatest, I mean the greatest decision any person can make in life is believing on the Lord Jesus Christ and becoming born again according to John chapter 3. The second A and B most important decision you can make are joining a church, a Bible-believing church, and renewing your mind. It, because the church, the institution of the church, a Bible-teaching church will help you renew your mind. And then if you renew your mind, you can prove that which is good and acceptable unto God. So the greatest decision is being born again. The second A and B is finding a church that preaches the Word of God, and then you renewing your mind according to the Word. There's a question, though. Where does God's Word hold priority in your life? Before I make any decision, I try, and I'm saying I'm trying, I'm going to explain that in a minute, I prioritize the Word. Now, there's been times where I haven't prioritized the Word. God has graced me through some of those decisions. Other times, I fall in fat on my face. Why? Not necessarily because it wasn't me. I didn't prioritize his word. In all thy ways, acknowledge him. He says that everything you do, from what you dress, what you wear, how you drive the word. See, some things we ask God out of because we feel like we become doctors in that, PhDs in that. I don't need to ask God how to get to work. I don't need to ask God what to wear. I know how to do that. I know how to dress. <clears throat> my job is giving me a handbook. But can I tell you all something? That what you wear can be designed by God to be used to minister to somebody, that they can notice you, 
by what you wear because God has told you to put that on. You think I'm getting deep. I'm just telling you in all your ways. He didn't say what ways. He just said all. Come on here. So there's nothing after all. How, how are you going to work? You may go to work the same way every day, but God may say, go this way. And you may, let me tell you a quick story. Uh, we, we were living in Georgia, and, 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 and I was on the side of the road. My car had broke down. On the side of the road, it was a busy time in Georgia, and I was just sitting there. Didn't have AAA, barely had a car insurance. I'm not sure we had car insurance. Just trying to do the best that I could. And a gentleman that I knew from Illinois lived in Georgia. Guess what? He saw me. He was driving this way. My car was on this side of the highway. Now, if you don't think about Georgia and 75, it's very busy. I don't know how he saw me. He said, I never drive this way. I normally go 20 to go home. He was driving on 75. He was going this way. He saw me. He wrapped around, got stuck in traffic, came over, and was a blessing to me. Why? Because he obeyed God. He went to work a certain way every day. But that day, God knew I needed somebody to help me get my car together. So he led that man, can I tell you, in all your ways. Acknowledge him. But how do you know God's voice? He knew God's voice by reading his word. Well, you can say that was just change. That was just happening. Said, I can give you a list of situations to where God has sent angels to bless me. Why? Because those angels responded to God's voice, but they knew God's voice because God's word was priority. I want you to go to Matthew chapter 4 tonight. Let's look at this together. I want you to look at this tonight because people of God, this is the pastor. If you prioritize God's word in your relationships, if you prioritize God's word uh, in how you raise your children, if you prioritize God's word in how you work in the commerce, in the marketplace, can I tell you, you will reap nothing but blessings. Now, I didn't say the world was going to be easy. He didn't promise you that. He just said, Lo, I'll be with you always, even until the end of the world. So God is giving you promises. He said, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I won't fear. Why? Not because I'm big and bad. I won't fear because thou art with me. So there's a covering that happens when I prioritize God's word. David wrote that because he understood what it's like to lead sheep to a dark place. But he said, like a sheep, like I'm shepherding my daddy's sheep, that's our relationship with God. God walks with me. So God walks with me through the valley of the shadow of death. But he also leads me beside the still waters. So there is a time in my life where I'll go through valleys, but thank God for the still waters. I wish I had a church. Thank God for an opportunity to be led by the still waters. Let's look at Jesus' response in a situation. I'm going to read verses 1 through 11. Let the pastor read the Bible to you. Let's just listen to the language of the Apostle Matthew. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit to the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward hungry. So physically, he was depressed. I mean, physically, he had and he had something going on. He was hungry. The Bible says Jesus, hypostatic union, Jesus is 100% man, Jesus is 100% God. So, but the man side of him was hungry. Watch this. You are a spiritual being. You're saved. You're sanctified. You're filled with the precious gift of the Holy Ghost. Uh, you, you, you run, you shout, you tithe, you do all the different things. But you have things that you go through that affect your natural man. You may have children. And those children are wayward. Are you in, their relationship may not be the best. That's a physical, earthly thing that you have to deal with as a believer. You and your spouse may be into it. You may be on your way to divorce court. You might have already went to divorce court. That's a physical, natural thing that affects the believer. You may have a sickness in your body. You're spiritual. You believe in the Lord Jesus, but you have physical things. Can I tell you all something? Jesus is our example according to 1 Peter. So what that means is that Jesus is in the wilderness being tempted. And not only is he being tempted, you all, he's battling his own hunger. Because of something that he's trying, he's trying to get closer to God, and in getting closer to God, he's having to go through mess. I feel like preaching. He's trying to do the right thing, but in him doing the right thing, he's going through a trial. Watch this what he does. And when the tempter came to him, he said, that I'll be the son of God, 
man that these stones be made bread. He answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. Then the devil taketh them up into a holy city, and set them in a pinnacle of the temple. He said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, one of my favorite scriptures. And in their hands they shall bear thee up, least at any time thou dash thy foot against the stone. Jesus said unto him, It is written, Again, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Again the devil taketh them up into an exceeding high mountain, and showed them all the kingdoms of the world, and the glory of them. And he said unto him, all these things I will give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. And said Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. I want to introduce something to you tonight in Bethlehem Nation that you probably are familiar with, but if you're not, this will be good for you to hear. I want you to write this word down the replacement principle. I want to teach you about the replacement principle. What the replacement principle says, people of God, is that we're going to remove the lies of Satan and circumstances and replace them with the truth of God's word. See, the replacement principle says to me is that there is information coming from all sources. We are inundated daily with information from the news, from seemingly church people, from real Christians, right? From our pads, from Facebook, I mean, from our family, people that are in our inner circle. All day, we are receiving and giving information. We live in an information hypersensitive world. Everywhere you go, somebody's trying to sell you something, whether that be a, a, a product or, 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 or a belief or a way of thinking, information is coming. Now watch this. In that information, Satan is very subtle. He will seek in lies that appear to be true to get you confused. See, remember something. God is not the author of confusion. Satan is. God is the author of peace. You don't like confusion. Anytime you see confusion in churches, in your marriage, in your children, can I tell you something? Satan is behind confusion. He, God is not in there. And see, people can, can come in the name of God, but they're not because anytime confusion is the foundation of how you're coming, there's no God in that. Well, how do I know that? The Bible says he's not the author of confusion. So the replacement theory, the replacement principle says the information that I'm getting, I have to prioritize God's word over that. Let me give you an example. Romans 6, 23, verse, uh, verse 23, look at part A. Part A says, the wages of sin is death. Okay? Now, this scripture can be used out of context to build up a lie about grace. Right? So I can take that part of scripture and say, well, if you sin, you're going to die. Part B of that scripture says this, Romans 6, 23, but the gift of God is eternal life happy. Through Christ Jesus our Lord. So there is some truth in that. The way you see it is death. But if, if I receive that information and I just stop there, I've lost all hope. But if I keep reading, the scripture says, but the gift of God, that means God will give me a gift. The gift of God is eternal life. How does it come? Through Jesus Christ. Now watch this. If you sin, God, you know, uh, uh, well, God, or that's a lot about grace and say this. Well, grace is just a license to sin. Because y'all, all you preachers talking about grace, now, the way I came up, it was hell out of the But, 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 are you negating part B of that scripture? Because I preach A and B. A says, the way you sin is that. If you continue in sin, you will die and go to hell. And the church said, amen. But, that word but is so big in the text. It says the gift of God, which is salvation, that comes only through Jesus Christ, Lord me. You can't earn salvation. You can't do your good. You can't do all these good deeds and pay for your past sins. Jesus already paid. You 
know I got a revelation, Sister Gibbs? I got a revelation that God told me. He says, you don't have to earn what I'm giving you in this season. He said, I've already paid for it. I just need you to appreciate it. See, we try to earn our stuff instead of appreciate it. Because we feel like if we do so many good deeds, it'll make up all the bad we did. There's nothing that can make up for what you've done except for the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ from Calvary's Hill. He died, did he die? And he rose from the grave. So that he paid that back the price that my sin caused. Now watch this. If I use the scripture out of context, I can flip it on you. I can say, well, if you're under grace, just sin as much as you want. Grace will save you. That's the wrong uh, understanding of that text. If I flip it and say, well, you have no hope. If you sin, then I'm misguiding you. So what am I doing? I got to prioritize the word. Go to Ephesians chapter 2. Look at verse 3 through 5. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, look at verse 3 through 5. Come on, say, turn with me, turn with me. Let's just read this Bible. Let's prioritize midweek service. I mean, just give me 45 minutes of your time. I don't need a whole lot, right? Because you've been at work all day, so you've been inundated. With information, I know you probably got your gospel music playing, you probably did your devotion, you probably had some, some sprinkles of a Bible, and, but again, if you're really working, you've been inundated with, with forms and, and deadlines and the latest gossip and, you know, whatever. So, so spend some time with your pastor and let's dig into this world, all right? Look here. Look at verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 4. <clears throat> Verse 3, among whom also we all had our conversations in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. So we were fulfilling our own desires of the mind. And we're by nature the children of wrath, even as others. So by our very nature, who we are at our core without Christ are heathens and trifling people. Without Jesus, we are trifling and heathenistic. We, by our own nature, we do the things that are not of God, right? So Jesus has to come in and change our nature. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation, he is a new nature. Look at verse 4. But God, look at this, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us. Watch what he did. Even when we were dead in sin, we were dead in sins, plural, hath quickened us together with Christ, so by grace you are saved. So when I prioritize the word, what I say about this text is that the old me had my conversation buried, marinated in foolishness and the lust of the flesh. Everything that I do, when I don't prioritize the word, gratifies me. This is what I want. This is where we going. This is what I'm going to do with my money. You can't tell me what to do. So when you are self-centered, Self-centered, it's all about you. So when you are self-centered, then the word can't align you. What's our theme for this year? Divine order and alignment. You cannot get aligned with God's will when you are the center of attention. But when you prioritize God's word, you humble yourself underneath the mighty hand of God, and he exalts you in due time. See, watch this. And I love old preachers who say, if you don't humble yourself, God will. He'll send a situation, he'll send a circumstance that'll humble you. And either it'll, it, like Mother Ship, you would say, it either draw you or it'll drive you. Now, I want to be drawn to God. Because the Bible says no man can come unless the Father draws him. So, so I don't want the Lord to drive me away. I want to be like the prodigal son. I want to come to myself, and then the father is waiting for me with the best robe, a ring, and a, and, and a party ready to, ready to happen. So, so the lie is, you don't die in sin. The truth of the matter is, look at verse 4, God is rich. That means he, he's rich in mercy. God help me. Aren't you excited, my brothers and sisters, of, of how rich God is in mercy? Are any of y'all online a recipient of his mercy? Come on, come on. If God was pop, if he was poor in mercy, we all be gone. But thank God, he's rich in mercy. Because even in our stupidity, even in our trifling, 
even in our uh, willful disobedience, he still rich in mercy. So look, watch this now. God is rich. Let's put this in context. He's not rich in mercy for you to keep sinning. He's rich in mercy. The Bible says it is the goodness of the Lord that leads me to repentance. See, God is not good for you to keep going back out there, keep doing it, keep shoving the job, and keep sneaking and dealing, keep having backside conversations. He's not gracing you to keep that mess up. He, he's, he's showing you goodness so that you can repent. Because if a man repents, then the heaven rejoices. But when man continues to seek sin, what I talked about last week, it grieves the Holy Ghost. See, the Holy Ghost is grieved when we take his goodness for granted and we stump on it. But thank God he's rich in mercy, not so we can keep sinning, but so that we can get it right. Somebody type on the screen, let's get it right, church. Let's get it right. That means I want to hold my brother accountable. That means I want to pray for them that have been overtaken in the fall. I, I, I want to love them. That, that are going through. I want to pray for them that have lost their way, that have lost their appetite for righteousness. I want to pray that God would begin to ignite a thirst and a hunger for God again. I want you to look at some key takeaways as, you talk, as we look at this thing about prioritizing God's word. Jesus prioritized God's word over proving to Satan that he, he was who he was. See, he could have turned the stones into bread. He made the stones. Colossians chapter 1, I think it is. All things that were created were made by him and for him. So God, Jesus, helped create those, I mean, he created those stones that Satan was telling him to command to turn into bread. Jesus also created the angels that were going to hold him up. See, Satan was talking to the man, and he didn't know he was talking to God. Because Satan, in disrespect, can never honor the Spirit of God in you. They talk to you like you're a mere man. And see, see, Satan didn't know that all the kingdoms belonged to him anyway, because he set up every kingdom. So, so Jesus prioritized the world. Let me help you give you another example how you prioritize the world. You get paid. <clears throat> And so you got this vacation that you get ready to take. Here's how you prioritize God's word. You, 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 see, you don't have to live check to check. You don't have to wait for any stimulus. See, God's giving you a stimulus package. That's what he's giving it to you. It, it's, called, it's called sowing and reaping. It's called being a good steward over what God gave you. And here's a practical one. It's called not overspending or living beyond your means. See, if you don't live beyond your means, guess what will happen? God can prosper you. And you can buy you a piece of land, and you can build a house on that piece of land, and you can rent that house out, and then you can take that rent money, and you go buy you another piece of land, and you can build another house, guess what's going to happen? And then you rent that out, you can take that money, and you go buy you a store, and you can take that money, and now you go buy you a strip mall. You see what I just did? I use natural things in order for you to get what you need. And then you take all that money, and you can start sponsoring missionaries, you can start sponsoring food giveaway, you can start doing things for the kingdom, but you got to start with some practice. Things, and that's living below your means, sowing, reaping, and saving. I'm preaching better than you respond. I got excited, so let me slow down. Live below your means, save your money, but sow your seed. Tithing is one aspect, and then so give an offering. Right? Because when you sow, God can bless you. When you pray, that's a seed. When you fast, that's a seed. And the Bible says, as long as the earth remains, there'll be seed time, talk to me, and harvest. You got a bill. You got a bill paid. Right? Okay, I'm going to pay these bills, but I'm also going to sow my seed. Because not, see, God didn't have you work just to be taking care of your natural needs. He needs you to take care of the spiritual needs as well. You don't pay God. You're sowing. God is not a bill. Prayer is not this one-sided conversation. Here's some early takeaways I want you to get out of this text. Tonight. Number one, I want you to be patient, but not complacent with yourself. See, as you're prioritizing God's word, you are renewing your mind. You're renewing your mind, and that takes time. Even I'm sharing with a, a, a Bible study that I was ministering out of Louisiana last night, 
and, and, and I was sharing with them this same text that I'm preaching to you tonight. But, but one of the things that, that I've even shared with some folks, even in, in, our, in our church, some of the stuff that I'm sharing is new information. It's always been there, but we're looking at it differently now. So you got to be patient with yourself, but not complacent. See, the moment that you say, well, I don't need that, what, what's, what you're doing is that you're shutting down revelation. See, see, any type of preacher is, pre Paul said it like this. He said, if a man comes preaching any other doctrine than what we preach, he says, consider him, you know, a castaway. What was the doctrine that Paul was preaching? Jesus Christ dying and raising from the dead. But Paul also talked about spiritual gifts. Paul also talked about the administration of those gifts. Paul talked about order in the church. Now, that all is wrapped up into the doctrine of Christ. Are you following what I'm saying to you? So, you got to be patient with yourself, but not complacent while you are prioritizing God's word. It's so plain tonight. I feel the Holy Ghost. The Spirit of God is here. Because it's so plain tonight. I feel this thing in my spirit. Because I want you to get it. So, be patient. As God is renewing your mind about certain teachings that I've taught. And as you study it, and you gotta make sure that when you're studying something, yeah, go, 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 go talk to people about it and, and get their feedback. But ultimately, prioritize this over anything. You want to read it and then implement this the law of first mention. Where God mentions it first until God changes it, it cannot be changed. Man can. So be patient. As, as you're renewing your mind, remember that as you're kind of. Getting back stronger as you're coming out of the world and into the marvelous light. Be patient, but don't be complacent. My brother Ty said this. He says, he says, some of y'all don't need no more confirmation. You need execution. Talk that in, Reverend Corbin. Somebody need to hear that. See, some of y'all get all this confirmation, but ain't got no execution. And this is the season for you to stop getting all of these prophetic words and start executing. Somebody scream execute. And how you execute is by prioritizing his promises concerning your life, concerning your healing, concerning your future. Stop just getting confirmation and start walking by faith. Oh, the Lord said this. Well, that's confirmation. Well, that's confirmation. When you execute. When you're going to put to practice what God has been uh, telling you and confirming to you, it's execution time, saints. Be patient. Here, here's another part. Here's another part. Here's another part. Take renewing your mind serious. Don't play with this. Don't play with, you know, this doctrine. You know, people are so, so embedded into what they believe in, they forget the Bible. That, that, that the reason that we have denominations it, it, it's not, it's not a bad thing in, 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 in and of themselves. But when man gets a hold of anything, we always mess it up. We always take things out of context. So denominations give you parameters. They give you, they give you a, uh, a, a measuring stick, if you will. But every denomination should, hopefully, abide by this prioritization of God's word over man. Over man. Like, we can't Rewrite the Bible because we upset with somebody or that we don't like something. No, the Bible is what it is. This has been written. It's outlast achievement. Guess what? It will stay forever. So when you're renewing your mind on the things of God, you got to take renewing your mind serious. Women, you got to take renewing your mind serious. Men, you got to take renewing your mind serious. Children, you got to take renewing your mind serious. Again, what the pastor tell you? All the time, information coming. TikTok give you information. YouTube give you information. Instagram give you information. Your, your, your uh, stiff-necked friends give you information. Stiff-necked church people give you information. And, and here's the problem. If we don't prioritize this, we'll take that and it'll look like truth. Listen, if you've ever read any Jehovah's Witness literature, it almost looks like Christianity. If you've ever read any Jehovah's Witness literature, it so mirrors the, 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 the scripture that it's like baffling. Like I read, I'm like, oh, this is real good. Until I get to certain parts of talking about the Washington, I'm like, oh, okay, okay, y'all almost got 
When you look at the undertones of certain people when they say things, you can see ain't no Bible in that. See, in our day and time, we call it people throwing shots or, or you know, throwing shade. But really, if there's undertones. And that's why we have to be, we have to be doers and knowledgeable of God's word. Because when you read the Watchtower's Bible, the New Living Translation of all the scriptures, John 1 and 1, in the beginning was the word, the word was God, and the word was a God. Well, you can't change that because you had a revelation, right? You, you can't do that. You, you got to know that, that by scripture don't say a God, it says it was God. The problem is that if we don't prioritize the word, if we don't take renewing our minds serious, we'll be like those people that were at Thessalonica. I'm scared when they went, when the Paul went there, and uh, I mean, yeah, to Maria, and those people were just wanted to hear a bunch of different stuff. They would just come to this place to hear something new. And, and they're forever learning, but never coming to the knowledge thereof. They have all this information, but never coming to the true knowledge of who the Lord Jesus Christ is. They don't, they don't prioritize the word. So they know a lot. They can spit off statistics. They can give you dates. They can give you names. And, and they can give you lineages. But they can't give you who, who Jesus is. They can't give you how to, how, how, how to lead somebody in a sinner's prayer. Because they don't prioritize God. I want, to, I want our church to prioritize God's word above everything. Take a look your mind seriously. Number three, this is warfare. So understand your weapons. Understand you got weapons. You got you have artillery. Prayer. Come on, that's an that's a weapon. Fasting. That's a weapon. Having scriptures on your hip so that when you pull out your spiritual weapon, you can shoot off scripture. These are weapons that God has. God has armed us with everything we need that we can make it through this war. This is warfare. Your enemy ain't fighting fair. Your enemy is digging up dirt about you. Your enemy is trying to get a posse against you. Your enemy is, is bringing up stuff that has nothing to do with anything. You know why? Because your, the devil don't fight fair. He throws dirt in your eyes. He hits you with bricks. Come on. He, he, gets, he, gets, he hangs up on you because he don't fight fair. But guess what? None of these things are going to move you. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue that rises against you shall be condemned. This is the evidence of the people of God. I'm trying to get you to understand that if you prioritize God, I feel God right there. God will give you weapons, and when you use those weapons, you will win. Come on, somebody say, I'll always win. I always win. It, my old pastor, Pastor Paul, following years ago, he said you can't lose with the stuff you use, provided you use the right stuff. But the stuff I'm using is Genesis to Revelation, and it's full of God's promises. And all of the promises of God are yes, they are amen. To the glory of God. I'm trying to get you to see this is warfare. So take this serious and understand how to use prayer. Prayer. Use prayer. Use, use scripture when you pray. Use it when you pray. You, when you fast, oh, you build up your spiritual man. Your fleshly man is hungry, but your spiritual man is like, God, I love this. When you fast. And don't just wait for the church to call a fast. Call a fast on your own. Now, if you're married, tell your spouse when you got to fast now. What the Bible tell you? Don't you be out of your willingness to talk about, I'm getting ready to fast, I'm getting ready to be close to God. The scriptures give you, tell your, tell your spouse. When you go to fast, it says for a time, and then come back together. We get off of that. Fast. When you, when you are uh, worshiping, hallelujah, that's a weapon. You know why? Because worship brings God. And wherever God is, I guarantee you, Satan is high telling God that. You know why? Because he don't know nothing to do with the Lord. That's why the Lord don't want you playing gospel music when you go to work. He wants you on the phone talking about something crazy. That's so why I tell me, me and my, my home, we talk all the time. And today he called me, and I was on my way in, and uh, I was listening to him. I said, now I'm worship. He said, man, go ahead, God. You can finish what you was doing. Why? Because he's prioritizing my worship time over our talking time. You know why? Because he knows that if I need something and he ain't there, he knows God won't do it. Worship is a weapon. I know you've heard the song. Praise is a weapon, but worship is well. Because why? Worship is my time to commune with God, and when God comes in, he removes every burden and destroys every yoke. Hallelujah. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Go to 
2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11. Prioritizing. Designating or treating something more important than other things. The word of God is more important than you getting back to that person who did you wrong. It got quiet right there on line. I never did. Prioritizing God's word is um, more important than you um, tell somebody else's business and try to mask it up as God. Prioritizing God's word is more important than you getting back at your spouse. Prioritizing God's word is more important than you buying the latest gadget. Prioritizing God's, God's word is more important than you uh, building up these walls and talking about you an introvert when you're really just, you're really just uh, anti-social, whatever the case may be. I mean, prioritizing God's word supersedes all that other stuff that, you, that we make up. I make up stuff all the time. But see, when I really prioritize God's word, it shows me who I really, what I really doing. I'm sure that's not, if I got time. Second Corinthians chapter 2. I'm if it's good, amen. Hallelujah. Second Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11. Look at this. I love Second Corinthians. Me and Reverend Coleman were talking about this earlier this week and how Paul had to defend, Paul had to defend his apostleship in Second Corinthians chapter 2. He had to defend it. Because they were questioning his apostleship. Oh, I had no problem defending it. And had no problem calling them fake apostles. Who are you to judge my apostleship? When Peter nor James and none of the apostles recognize you. Look at verse 11. He also helping together by prayer for us, that for the gift bestowed upon us by the means of many persons, thanks may be given by many on our behalf. Alright? Um, go to 1 Corinthians 14. 1433. See, Paul had trouble in Asia. He said, but people were praying for him. People were lifting up his name. And because of that, thanks may be given on me on our behalf. In other words, God bless the Lord. First with this 1433. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. That's what the Bible says. As in all churches. Of the saints. So all churches mean Baptist, Methodist, Kojic, Apostolic. If there's a church open in God's name, it says God, no church should have confusion. That was the Bible. Okay, let me just read it again. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. As in all churches of the saints. So wherever there are saints, there should be confusion. There's confusion, there's Satan. And he needs to be cast out by the authority of Jesus Christ. If the preacher got confusion going on, the devil needs to be cast out. If the members got confusion going on, the devil needs to be cast out. It's tight, but it's right. It's right in the hand. If God is the author of confusion, then who is? Yeah, right. Satan. So what does Jesus do to Satan in this whole ministry? Cast him out. Hallelujah. One of Satan's biggest weapons is this. Here it is. Number one, suggestion. Suggestion is an idea or a plan put forward for consideration. So in and of itself, suggestion is not wrong, but anytime Satan's behind the suggestion, it's always wrong. There is no good in Satan. He has no good bone in his body. When he fell from his heaven and came to the earth and the Lord cast him down here, according to Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14, he is evil. He is the epitome of evil. So Satan is behind, write this down, non-biblical suggestions. Maybe you should get back at it. That's a non-biblical suggestion. Jesus, God said, vengeance is mine, saying, but Lord, I will repay. Maybe you should, you should steal that. Maybe you should. I mean, I mean, you are just talking about them. It ain't really gossip if you're praying. That's a non-biblical Satan suggesting. And if you don't prioritize God's word, remember what I said about the information? Satan can creep in a lie and it can look like the truth. If I made beef stew for you, if I made it for you and you didn't see me cook it, you would eat the stew based on your trust you have for me. Now, now, now I know some of y'all online and y'all can probably attest to this. You don't eat everybody's cooking. 
Why? Because everybody ain't clean. Talk to me, somebody. Well, guess what? Satan ain't clean at all. And he can give you some soup, and it can look good, it can smell good, but that deep kind of at the bottom of it. Guess what that stew is smell good, look good, but do you it's going to kill And the wages of sin is that book they give it about. If you will prioritize God's word, because Jesus is the word made flesh, if you prioritize that word, you have the gift of God, which is eternal life. But see, he'll suggest to you that God's word can't stand. He brings fear. You get hit with COVID. I got a testimony I'm going to share with you in the month of April about a, a family member that got COVID, and, and, and they were honest with me. They said, they said, Travis, they said, every day I woke up, I was just like, they said, I wasn't really scared of dying, per se. They said, I didn't want to die this. So Satan, every morning they got up, he was suggesting, it's going to be the day you die. You're going to be one of that number. He suggested that. Well, they had to prioritize God, and it's hard, y'all. It's hard. I ain't lying. I know firsthand when you got to look that demon in the face and say, for God I live, for God I die. You trembling the whole time. You say that. I get it. But you got to stand there and have you done all the do. You got to stand. That's why he gave you gear for your front and not for your back because he never intended for you to run. He gave you suggestions. That's why I told you that key takeaway was be patient with yourself, man. Don't beat yourself up if you if you miss an opportunity to prioritize God's word up. Just get back on the saddle. Hallelujah. Don't beat yourself up. Watch this. The second biggest weapon Satan has is scenario-based attacks on your mind. So then you remember that sermon I preached? Destroying the scenario-based ministry? Go to Joel chapter 3. Go to Job chapter 3. Go to Job chapter 3. Go to Job chapter 3. Look at verse 25. For the thing which I greatly fear is come upon me, and that which I was afraid of is come unto me. I was not in safety, neither had I rest. Neither was I quiet, yet trouble came. Job said, I built these scenarios in my mind. And the scenarios that I built, and I let Satan put in my mind, they come to pass. You got to watch the scenario based ministry in your mind. My life would be better if I was single. And you start building that up. And then you lose a good man, you lose a good woman, and now you're yeah, not married again, but it ain't what God desired. Hallelujah. In some situations, it's probably better than what it is, but you better be careful. You better make sure it's God. You know, if I just went on this job, I could do more for the church. And then God allows you to leave that job, and now you're unemployed, now you're to leave God for your next meal, and you ain't even coming to the church because you're trying to hustle. Because you built this scenario up in your head of how you think it would be. But here what the Bible says, in all your ways, acknowledge Him. Prioritize God's Word. See, Job said, the thing... I didn't say this. Job said it. So don't get mad at me. He said, the thing that I fear is come upon me and that which I was afraid of. In 2019, I was battling something and my brother said, he said, be careful of what you be scared of. He said, you'll bring it to pass. So we got to destroy that. We got to stop putting the fear that Satan is bringing and building that up. Oh, like, have you ever, like, like you about to go into a meeting and you can just visualize yourself getting to it somebody and you going to say this and then you visualize yourself getting into a fight and doing all this? Uh, <laughs> I got a witness in the back. Watch this. That's a scenario based ministry in your mind. You got to destroy that because that's enemy's tactics for you not to prioritize. Watch this. First Corinthians said he ain't all the confusion. So any meeting you go into, whether it's secular or sacred, you are the peacemaker. Blessed are the peacemakers for they shall have the kingdom of God. That's the book. So if God is the author of confusion but of peace, and you got God on the inside of you, why are you visualizing a fight and meeting you get ready to go into? Because we don't prioritize God's word. We don't prioritize God's word. You know what the Lord is teaching me in this, in this first quarter? He's teaching me how to be humble and hungry. Humble enough 
to, 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 to admit when I'm wrong and to apologize when I'm wrong or, uh, or somebody says something, just take it and be the bigger person and keep on moving, but also hungry for his presence. I've sought God more this first quarter than I've ever had. You know why? Because I'm hungry for him. I don't strip everything away. I've been broke before. I've been had no talent before. But God, I just won't be. And so God is not stripping me away because why? He says, I need somebody like you where you are so you can have other people be hungry for me. You got to destroy that. See, Job, he saw his children partying and, and then dying. He had to see fear. He, he said he was scared of that. He said he was afraid. And that came up on him. I want you to renew your mind. Renew your thinking. I'm not going to get to all of this. You got to renew it, y'all. We got to prioritize scripture. So, so if fear comes on you, here's a, here's a replacement principle. Okay. Fear that mm, um, if you have this meeting, uh, they don't, you know, it's going to turn into a fight. That's the fear. That's the, so that's, that's the information Satan gives. You replace that with the word of God. You say, Lord, you're not the author of confusion, but of peace. So, Father, I speak peace into this meeting I'm getting ready to go into. Replace with you. Okay? You got to sit. You got a cold. And so some of the symptoms look like COVID, right? You cough it. So, so the, 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 the lie is you got COVID. Now, you ain't no doctor. You ain't been no doctor yet, but you tell yourself you got COVID, right? Okay? So that's a lie. Replace with you. says, okay, Lord, Lord, by your stripes, even if I have whatever, I'm healed. I've replaced that. Now, that thought may keep coming. Every time it comes, I replace it. Every time it comes, I replace it. Now, you may replace it enough to where you get some relief for about an hour. And then he starts right back up. Let's do it with lust. Lust comes. Cars, money, women, men, whatever, okay? Lust comes. And I don't know about you, but I've been in my, my room before, my first my early when I first got saved, and I mean lust, 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 lust. And I'll be fighting like fighting like that. And so I'm like, man, when can I get some relief? The relief is not in acting out what you visualize. That's not the relief. That's only temporary. Because guess what? Lust ain't leaving when you when you appease lust, it gets stronger. When you appease fear, the peace it means that you give in to it, it gets stronger. Here's how you get rid of it. When it comes, you replace it with the God's word. So instead of me lusting, I'm going to worship. Worship is pure. Lust is the satanic. It's filthy. Lust is filthy. Worship is pure. So I'm going to worship. I'm going to replace that. Now I'm going to have to do that for about two hours straight. And then I get some relief. And Tuesday I'm good. But then by Wednesday, here it comes again. But I'm imploring the replacement principle. So I'm taking the lie of Satan and I'm replacing it with the truth of God's word. Here's the caveat. i got to get in his word. i got to study to show myself a cruel unto God. Well, Pastor, you know, I need to sleep when I get God's word. Okay, let me give you three principles that are not in my notes that I want to help you with. Here are three principles to help you study your Bible. Number one, topical study. Final topic, tongues. You want to know more about tongues? Study. That's a topic. Faith, healing, uh, how people misrepresent prosperity. Study. It's a topic. Here's the second one character driven Bible study. Character driven Bible study. When you study the character of the Bible, David, Paul, Elijah, Lydia, uh, Phoebe, study a character. The, 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 the disciple, study of character. You got top of book, you got character. Third one, good one. Uh, books of the Bible. Study your book of the Bible. Ephesians, James, Hebrews. And see, I'm studying right now the book of James. In one of my, one of my seminary courses, we're looking at the book of James, expository preaching with James. Watch this. And I'm reading things about James that I've never looked at. You know why? Because I'm reading, going back and I'm just reading the text. See, the more familiar you get around that word, topical, character, a Bible study, what happens is, lots of people go, when the lie comes, you can identify it quicker, and you can replace it quicker. I'll teach you good tonight. I can, I can recognize the lie, and then I can replace it. But the less I know, it's harder for me to compute it. Like, for instance, 
I was learning algebra, they had to teach me addition first. So then when I got to the, uh, uh, order of operations, I could start doing those things quicker. But I had to learn addition before they taught me multiplication. So God says the more you get in my word, you can recognize those lies and all that information that you get. You be like, man, that ain't God. I know that ain't God. Because why? I'm familiar with the real thing. Okay? Are you still here? So I give you those right topical character and Bible studies. Um, <clears throat> I don't have time. Let me give you this last scripture, and then we're going to end. Hope y'all get some out of this. Any questions yet, Brother Coleman? No, no question. We're good. Okay. Second Corinthians chapter ten. Second Corinthians chapter ten. Second Corinthians chapter ten. You know the scripture. So Satan's biggest weapons are lit. Let's look at it again. Suggestion. He suggests something that can be considered. Or he gives you a scenario in your mind. He wants you to build that scenario up so that scenario can become reality. I've even caught myself building scenarios. I gotta deal with the scriptures you're ready to tell me. Look at verse, look at chapter, verse 3. Chapter 10, verse 3. Now listen to me. When I read scriptures that you know, don't be arrogant. Humble yourself and receive this word. Because you may see something new. Okay? For though we walk in the flesh, that means we walk in the flesh. We're spiritual beings. We church members believe we're in the flesh. We do not war after the flesh or according to the flesh. We don't, we don't fight like this. We don't fight like this. We don't fight like that. You know, that's how we fight. For the weapons of our warfare, what did I tell you? That this is warfare, but you got some weapons. The weapons of our warfare are not cardinal. They're not fleshly. They're not man-made. But mighty through God to the pulling down of the scenarios or the strongholds you build in your mind. Casting down imaginations or arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and brings to captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So guess what? When suggestion comes, I recognize that and I prioritize God's word. I say, you can't say it. You're not of God. Come on. I'm not going to judge. When you blame other people, you are, you're telling yourself subconsciously, it ain't on me, it's on them. When you prioritize God's word, I'm going to show you this real quick before I leave. You can cast down imagination. You can cast down scenarios that are not God. That are not backed by God. They're backed by Satan. And anything that's backed by Satan, let me say it again, it is evil and it will come to nothing. We're going to pick up here next week. Go to James chapter 1. It ain't in my notes. I just got to download. I'm sorry. James chapter 1. Look at verse number 19. Through 24. I'm sorry, for 25. I'm not going to read it. I want you to study that. James chapter 1, verse 19 to 19 through 25. And we're going to pick up there next week. Can I pray with you over prioritizing? I know. I'm sorry. I, I got to end because I want to be a good steward over our time. Hopefully, you're getting something out of this. Hopefully, this blessed you. Um, I got a couple more stuff to do, man. But uh, 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 don't be bogged down by suggestions. And scenarios. Be patient with yourself. Take renewing your mind serious. This is warfare that we're in. Spiritual warfare. God's given us spiritual weapons that only work in the spiritual realm, but they produce earthly manifestation. Thy kingdom come on earth. Where was it? Where did it originate? As it was in heaven. As it is in heaven. So we want heaven to come to earth. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray for these your people. I love you. I love your sheep. God, I love your sheep. These sheep belong to you, but thank you for letting me be a steward of them and preach them. I, I give you praise for that. Bless those that are hearing this word. Bless those that are not going to make a commitment of faith as Reverend Coleman comes and opens the doors of the church. But I pray that we prioritize God's word. We need you. In this season, we need you, God. We don't need political appointments we need. We need God. So Father, I'm praying that your kingdom come and that your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
bless these your people in Jesus' name. Let's receive her before we say amen.
Let us know your decision. Go to our website, newbethelinkychurch.com, and type your decision in there, and we'll be sure to send someone with you and to be able to contact you and pray with you. Go ahead and follow you. It's great to say, Father, we thank you on tonight. We thank you, Father God, that the Holy Spirit is moving in this place. We thank you, Father God, for the lives that's changed through this dynamic word on tonight. We thank you for the speaking on tonight right now, Father God. Continue to bring forth clarity. Continue to bring forth with understanding right now, Father God. For us to be able to prioritize in this season, in this season of upgrade, in this season of change, in this season of power, peace, and authority that you've given us to us. Lord, bless the individual that received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Bless the individual, Lord God, that we dedicated their lives to Christ on tonight. And bless the individual that chose to be able to join this great ministry. Lord, send souls this way. We're going to continue to preach and teach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, that you may be edified, that you may be magnified, that you may be glorified. We thank you on tonight. This is how many blessings that we ask to be in your son, Jesus, that we pray that everybody that loves the Lord say, Amen, Amen. Put your hands together one more time for our pastor, Pastor Travis, of course. Amen. Thank you so much, amen, for those who made a commitment. We're praying for you. We're asking that God do a great work in you. Listen, this is our time. We can sow together. We want to sow your tithes, your offerings, or your all in. I want to pray for you and then give you a couple of announcements. And then we're going to be ready to shortly to go and speak a lesson over your life. Amen. You have three ways that you can sow into the ministry tonight. You can sow through uh, traditionally by mailing or bringing your tithes or offerings or all in praise from the past. The 5803 Belmont Avenue, East St. Louis, Illinois, 62203. You can go to our website, newbethelinkychurch.com, go to the Give tab, and utilize it that way, or you can utilize Cash App. You can use Cash App, uh, and Cash App will allow you to sow. Make sure you put that purple emblem with our, our logo there, New Bethel MV Church, with the dollar sign in the front. And make sure in the... Um, File that you put, let it score, tithes, offering, all in, Sunday school, whatever it may be, please sow your seed. Can Pastor pray with you? Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for seeing the sow and multiplying the seed sown. Father, I decree and declare that God, you will bless them 100 fold. That Father, we give you praise, God, for being good stewards over the finances you've given us. We thank you that you rebuke the devourer for our sake. You cause our education, we, God, to be paid in full. We give you praise for that in advance. The lady of our seventh floor, God, being fully complete, God, and fully functional. We give you praise. We say it until we see it, and we see it before we see it. We give you praise, and we give you glory for all the things you've given this church to do for the community. And the finest to get it done, in Jesus' name, we say amen. Amen. So you see electronically, or have you given tonight, we give God praise tonight. Listen, it's going to have me hard that I stand before you all that our church lost a great member. Uh, our, our, our dear beloved sister Patricia Hagerman transitioned from earth to glory last night. I was with her family at the hospital last night. She transitioned late last night, early this morning, I believe. Uh, so we are planning a funeral arrangements and all that. So we'll be getting that information out to the church. So please pray for her daughter and her son. Got a chance to meet them for the first time last night. They were doing well and uh, got to meet some of the family. So pray for her. Member of our church, a sweet lady. Every time I would come in for any service prior to COVID, she had a hug for me. During COVID, she was still battling some sickness, and she made it a duty to call her pastor. At least once a week, maybe once a month, sometimes she would just call me out of the blue just to say hello and how much she loved me, how much she cared about me. I thank God for that because she was going through, but she still was a blessing to us. So pray for her family. Amen. We thank the Lord that we can say about her based on what we know. She made a confession of faith that Jesus was her Lord. So we know that we'll see her again in glory, but it still hurts in our flesh. So stay tuned for that information. Don't forget about tax services going on on Tuesdays and Saturdays. That ministry has been going well. We've been blessing people. They've been blessing the Sonia and that team. And we're doing a wonderful job, so don't forget about that. Don't forget about registration to open up this Sunday, uh, March 14th. We'll be coming back March 21st at 10 to 10 a.m. Now you must register. If, uh, once registration stops, if you still want to show up, there is a first come, first serve um, overflow in the fellowship hall with a screen. 40 people in there. We are working the tweet stop now to get prepared for you to come in. Thank God that we have the tank off, we have clean uh, things, and we have a good exit plan 
you so just bring your mask. You're ready to come to worship, amen. You'll be safe where we are, amen, to give God glory. If you're not feeling well, we pray that you stay home and we'll continue to pray for you. Amen. Lord, your hand with oil. Amen. The Bible says a prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. Amen. So registration will open up on the 14th. But we are coming back March 21st. I can't wait, amen, to see some of you all back in the house. Amen. If you don't feel comfortable, amen. Amen. We pray that you just stay home and you continue to worship us virtually. If you feel up to it, come on out. We can't wait to see you. The church doors will be open. Listen, other than that, I can't think of anything else. I want you to stay prayed up. I want you to stay fast. Let me bless on your life from Numbers chapter 6. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron unto his son, saying, On this wise, you shall bless the children of Israel. Say unto them, The Lord bless thee, and the Lord keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee, and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee, and give thee peace. Watch this. And they shall put my name on the children of Israel. I will bless them. Now may the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide. Be with you this now and forevermore. I speak a blessing over your life. Cannot be reversed. For it is the blessing that comes from only from God. But I say unto one, I say unto all, watch and pray till we meet again. Have a great evening, y'all. Hopefully I'll see you this Sunday. Be blessed.